If you've ever asked the question, what must I do to be saved, then you have something in common with someone mentioned in the book of Acts in the Bible. The Philippian jailer is mentioned in Acts chapter 16 and asks that very same question to two of his prisoners, the Apostle Paul and one of Paul's partners in the ministry named Silas. They answered the jailer with a very direct statement, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. That sounds simple enough, doesn't it? Believe in the Lord Jesus. To make sure that we understand the answer given by Paul and Silas, let's first examine exactly what it means to be saved according to the Bible. To understand how to be saved, a person first needs to understand why he needs to be saved and what he needs to be saved from. The Bible teaches that all people are sinners who have broken God's laws. All people have rebelled against God and justly deserve death and punishment for their sins. The reason why we need to be saved is because we have sinned against God a God who is good, holy, and a God that loves us. Many people would say that we need to be saved from our sin. And while that's true, there's something much greater and more frightening that we need to be saved from, and that is the just wrath of God against sinners. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10 states that Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. Many people are uncomfortable with the idea of God's wrath, but the Bible is clear. God is not only a God of love, but he is a God also of justice. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4 says, He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. His justice demands that he punish sinners. Think of it this way. Let's suppose that a man committed the crime of rape. He came before the judge and said to the judge, Your Honor, I admit, I did rape that woman, but I'm sorry. There are many other women with whom I have interacted in my life, and I have treated them with respect, and have even gone out of my way to help many of them. Surely, since I have treated all those other women well, you could let me go. I know that you are a good judge and a loving judge. Therefore, I ask that you dismiss my case, since you are so good and loving. If that judge were to let that man go unpunished, we would rightly be outraged. We would cry out for that judge to be fired. Because the judge is loving and a good judge, he must punish that rapist. And it's the same way with God. Proverbs 17 verse 15 states that he who justifies the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. That's a very important idea about God that even the ancient philosophers like Socrates knew quite well. They knew that a perfect God would also mean perfect justice, which means that he cannot simply let sin, any sin, go unpunished if he was in fact a perfect judge. God must punish sinners because he is loving and just. If you love something, you must hate that which hurts it. If you love people, for example, you must hate murder. If you love children, you hate pedophilia. In fact, the more that you love them, the more you will hate that which sins against them. God is rightly angry at sinners. Psalm 7 verse 11 says, God is a just judge, and God is angry with the wicked every day. God's just wrath against sinners is taught all throughout the scripture. God's word says in John 3 verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. In Ephesians 2 verse 3, Paul states that the unsaved are children of wrath. Romans 1 verse 18 states, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And Romans 2 says, We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. These are only a few of the scriptures that indicate that the unsaved will face God's holy wrath on the day of judgment. So, keeping in mind Proverbs 17.15, how can we, as sinners who justly deserve God's wrath, be forgiven our sins if it would be evil for God to justify the wicked? The only way was for a perfect, sinless substitute to be punished in our place. That is, the wrath of God for our sins needs to be satisfied. 
That's called propitiation. 1 John 4 verse 10 says, Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sin. So God the Father sent God the Son, Jesus, to be born a human. He lived a sinless life and perfectly fulfilled the will of the Father. That means that Jesus was the only person in history that deserved to go to heaven. He could have demanded that they open up the gates for him because he had earned the right to enter. When he was on the cross, it was not the nails or the beatings or the crown of thorns that saved us. It was that when he was on the cross, the full weight of all your sin was put on him and God poured out his just and righteous cup of wrath on him for our sake. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What that means is that Christ traded places with us. He took our place for the sins that we have committed, past, present, and future. And the second part of that verse says that he did so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So in exchange, he gives us his perfect record to be judged with. So on judgment day, we will not appeal to our lives, but to his perfect life with no sin. It is his righteousness that we boast in. All sin must be punished. Either your sin will be punished on judgment day with the wrath of God, or it will be punished 2,000 years ago on that cross. The choice is yours. In the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, Written hundreds of years before Christ, it prophesied of a Savior that would come to take away the sins of the world in this way. It says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. So how does a person get this forgiveness of sin that is offered freely to all? That brings us back to the answer given to the Philippian jailer by Paul and Silas in Acts 16. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Does this mean that all you have to do is believe in what the Bible says about Jesus and you will be forgiven for your sin and will be saved from God's wrath? To answer this question, let's examine another verse in the scripture that talks about belief. The Bible says in James 2 verse 19, You believe that God is one. You do well, even the demons believe, and shudder. Yes, even the demons believe, but they are most certainly not on their way to heaven. Obviously, the word believe is used in two different senses in both of those verses. In James 2.19, the demons believe the facts about Jesus, but they've never repented of their sins or submitted to Jesus as Lord. In Acts 16.31, Paul and Silas must obviously be talking about a deeper level of belief than that of the demons. In fact, if you look up that word in the Greek, it has the connotation of faith and trust as well as intellectual belief. Belief that saves not only involves believing the facts about Jesus as revealed in Scripture, but it also involves repentance of sin. The Scripture is clear on this requirement. Repentance and faith are both necessary for salvation. Jesus said in Luke 13 verse 3 and 5, No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Mark 1 verses 14 through 15 says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus said in Luke 24 verses 46 through 47, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. In Acts 3 verse 19, Peter, preaching to a crowd of people, says, Repent therefore and turn again that your sins may be blotted out. In Acts 20, verses 20 through 21, Paul, speaking about his past ministry, says that he did not shrink from declaring to you, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. These are only a few of the many passages of Scripture in which repentance is mentioned as being necessary for salvation. 
You may notice that in some cases only repentance is mentioned in relation to salvation. In other cases in scripture, such as Acts 16 verse 31, only belief or faith is mentioned in relation to salvation. Sometimes the author's intent was to emphasize the faith component of salvation. Sometimes the author's intent was to emphasize the repentance component of salvation. Other times he wanted to emphasize that both repentance and faith are necessary. This is why we must learn to read scripture as a whole and not just pick out a verse here or there to make our point. Scripture is plain. Repentance and belief are both necessary for salvation. So what is repentance? Repentance is not feeling bad about your sin or feeling regret for your sin. Often it contains a regret for your sin, but it involves a willingness to turn from your sins and a willingness to, at the same time, turn to Christ and have him be your Lord. Repentance comes from a word in the Greek language called metanoia, and it means to change one's mind. That's what it literally means. Meta for change, noia means mind in Greek. You need to change your mind about sin. Does that mean that you need to be perfect before you can come to Christ? Of course not. If that was the case, no one could be saved. But you must truly be willing to turn from your sin and change your mind about your sin. And if you truly change your mind about it, it will result in action, even if that action is feeble at first. This repentance also involves a turning towards the Lord, and again, a willingness to make Him your Lord. Jesus says in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You can truly rest in him, and in his forgiveness. And it doesn't matter what you've done. Literally anything you can think of, he can and wants to forgive. But also notice that even though his yoke is easy... A yoke, by the way, is what they used to put on an ox when they would drag a plow. And even though it is easy and it's light, it's still a yoke. He is still the boss. If you follow Jesus, you must be willing to dethrone yourself and enthrone him. So what about you listening to this? Maybe you've never heard any of this before. Maybe you've heard all this before, ever since you were little and you grew up in the church. Have you ever truly repented of your sin? and put your faith in Jesus, submitting to him as Lord, and embracing him for all that the scripture reveals him to be. Romans 10 verse 9 through 10 says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. I urge you to get in a quiet place where you won't be disturbed, and think about your sin. Think about how you have offended a holy God that loves you. Think about how you have failed to live for him. Then think about what he did for you at the cross. God the Father loved you enough to pour out his just wrath upon his very own Son, who had never done anything wrong. God the Son loved you enough to bear the wrath of his very own Father in your place. God is the author of salvation. We love him because he first loved us. So if you want to be saved, earnestly cry out to him and ask him to save you. Ask him to give you a new heart. Ask him to remove your heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. Ezekiel 36, 25-27 says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. These verses are most likely the background for Jesus' words to Nicodemus in their conversation about being born again in John chapter 3. Being born again means that God has worked in a person's heart and removed their heart of stone and replaced it with the heart of flesh and has caused them to be sensitive to and broken over their sin and has caused them to begin to hate sin that they once loved and caused them to have desire to surrender and to submit to God whom they once ignored and hated.
If you repent of your sin and believe the good news, the gospel that God has sent his son to take the punishment for your sins, you will be saved. Your eternal destiny is secured and you will be with Christ in heaven when you die. And the fear of death and the freedom from the bondage of sin and the peace of the Lord will be yours.